Um, and I already set the camera. So I, I normally get an indication that it started recording. Um. Okay, uh, I have an indication that we're recording, so I think that uh, we're back uh, with uh, CSE 142. Welcome to the adventure of spring quarter dealing with this virus. Um, I thought people might find it interesting to hear a little bit. The campus is fairly empty. Uh, I took a 372 bus in this morning and there were a total of five passengers uh, on the bus. So we were all able to spread out and keep our distance and keep the driver safe at the same time. Yesterday I had office hours uh, through Zoom. Uh, I had mentioned that uh, on Monday and I'd mentioned that uh, you could find the link in Canvas. Uh, I've set up another place to find that link that I'll show you in a second. Um, it's very interesting. I had a lot of students stop by, heard a lot of different things from people, a lot of different kinds of questions that people had. So that was uh, great uh, to have uh, students talking to me uh, and uh, kind of just checking in <laughs> to feel connected to the course. Uh, soon you're going to be able to make that kind of connection with your individual TA when the discussion sections start tomorrow. So on the class webpage, I've added a new tab here called Zoom Links. If you go to it right now, it just shows a link for my office hours. Uh, there, later today, uh, I will be putting a table here that shows the Zoom links for each of the different discussion sections. And the discussion sections will be starting tomorrow. Uh, so you'll want to uh, be checking out that link so you can participate in the Zoom chat that will be the, uh, uh, this week's uh, discussion section. It's not going to cover uh, particularly uh, Java material, it's more getting used to the technology, getting to know each other, uh, getting to know your TA. Um, I'm also going to be updating, there's a course staff page that has my information, but there'll be a lot more information later today when we have the names of the TAs, what section they're doing, their email address, so you'll have contact information for them. I believe that our course administrator, Pim Lustig, is uh, combining sections, readjusting things, so I think you, know, may, you may be hearing from him uh, because he's uh, uh, trying to have the right number of students in each of the different sections that we're going to have. Um, on this staff page, I just thought I would point out that I remind you that there's an anonymous uh, form here that you can use, give, a, give anonymous feedback to me uh, about the course, so if there's anything that you'd like to let me know. I got anonymous feedback from someone saying that they wanted to know uh, about section, you know, how that's going to work. And so, as I said, uh, there will be the information, contact information of who your TA is here, and then the Zoom link page will have the links uh, to the Zoom chat uh, that you should uh, go to tomorrow uh, during your section time so that you can participate in section. Okay, I got a long list of things that I wanted to talk about here. Uh, I, uh, I, I mentioned that we're going to have question of the day. Um, I'm just trying to think up things that we could do that give us uh, a little bit of uh, uh, something else to think about or, you know, this might be kind of some fun things that happen along the way. Uh, so the question that I did uh, was where you are uh, or where you're going to be for most of spring quarter. So you can see that the most common answer was Seattle area. 57% uh, just around, around 24% in uh, Washington State but not the Seattle area, 10.5% uh, in some other part of the U.S. and 8% uh, in another country. And a lot of you uh, responded, which is great. I, I hope we can continue to have a, a high uh, uh, response rate uh, on the question of the day. So on the class webpage, what I, I changed it to on Monday is I had a link to the Monday lecture and then a link to the Monday question of the day. So in a few hours, I'm going to change this so that it has the Wednesday lecture and it has the Wednesday question of the day. So I'd ask you to, again, you know, go to the question of the day, uh, fill it out so that we can uh, show you the results uh, in Friday's lecture. Um, I thought I would mention something. I mean, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about 
the virus and our situation, but uh, there was something that I thought was uh, worth mentioning to you that you might find interesting. Um, so this, on Monday I had mentioned that one of the reasons that people take a class like 142 is it's just very clear that everybody these days is using computers to be able to, you know, I mentioned Knut's quote about teaching to the computer how to do various things that you want to do. And so people who are trying to track what's going on or make projections, you know, obviously they're using computers a lot for all of this. So the kinds of skills we're teaching in this class are, you know, uh, essential right now for people who are trying to do those things. Uh, I myself have been doing some computations in an Excel spreadsheet where I've been trying to track some of these uh, changes over time. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't have a, a model that's worth mentioning, but it's, it was, uh, interesting to me to be able to get some uh, some sense of some of these numbers. I did want to mention that there's a there's a group there's a a, a URL I was going to show you here uh, a, a group here at the University of Washington uh, at the School of Medicine. This is their uh, web page. I think you can even leave off the HTTPS depending upon what browser you're using. But so COVID19.healthdata.org. So that's a UW research group and they've been doing projections of what kind of strain we might have on the healthcare system, projections of total number of people who would get sick and so forth. And uh, yesterday at the presidential briefing, there were all sorts of slides that came from this webpage. So uh, at least the Trump administration is paying a lot of attention to the different uh, projections that are being done here. So let me show you uh, what you find when you open up that site, is they tell you a little bit about these various projections. And they have uh, projections for the country. Uh, this is where that Trump administration was coming up with a number of, there might be 100 to 200,000 uh, uh, deaths by the time we're through with all of this. But this number is kind of based on the idea that we're going to do the social distancing the higher numbers that they were mentioning would be if we weren't uh, going to be continuing a lot of the social distancing uh, uh, that we've been doing. Uh, so um, that's uh, uh, what I find particularly interesting, and actually I think people have talked about this a little less, is that you can uh, go here and take a look and look up specific projections for individual states. And uh, so they have a projection for Washington State that we are going to have uh, peak resource use in 14 days. I was surprised that some of the newer uh, hotspots, like I have relatives in Michigan, I was looking up Michigan, and they're gonna peak before us. And at first I thought that was strange, you know, but we've been doing these mitigation efforts longer, so why would they peak earlier? And then I realized that's actually a good thing for us. You know, you, you don't want it to peak early because that's what they've been talking about, how if there's a spike in cases, uh, it could end up uh, overloading the, the uh, healthcare system. So actually, uh, the projection for Washington State is not uh, nearly as dire as it is for other places. And you can go here if you're interested and see what their projections are. I guess the other bit of good news that uh, I, I take from this is that uh, the things that we've been doing are working, you know, and that they're likely to work in other parts of the country too. So in any event, there was a UW connection, so I thought that you might find it uh, interesting to, to know about the, that website uh, and their projections. Back to 142, uh, I want to spend some time talking about uh, some different issues. Uh, so, um, I have uh, put up homework one. So if you go to the homework tab on the class webpage, you'll see uh, various things that have been included here for our homework one. Now normally our homeworks are gonna be due on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock. And I would recommend that you try to get this homework done by Tuesday at 11 o'clock if you can. Uh, we're gonna be moving into a new material that'll be used for homework two. So you don't wanna get kind of too deeply into new material before you finish the old material. So it's good to start early, uh, try to finish it by Tuesday. But I know that there's a lot going on for people, there's a lot of issues, and so I just decided to give you until Thursday as the official due date. So uh, I'm extending the due date for this first one 
Our second one will be due on a Wednesday, and then our third one will go to our Tuesday due dates. But so I'll give you a little leeway on this one in case you need it, you're settling in, you're trying to figure out how to use all of the different tools and so forth. So there's a specification here that you can link on, a link to, uh, click on, uh, that will describe the homework assignment to you. Um, now, uh, I did want to talk a little bit, uh, 142, uh, people tend to know that we have um, high standards for grading, uh, for homework. Um, we don't tend to have students all getting 100% on homework. So uh, students often lose points for various things. And I think you know, maybe coming out of high school or something, people aren't as used to you know, losing points on homework. But I think that uh, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be the end of the world <laughs> to lose a few points on a homework. Uh, I think that you can learn from that experience. But I, what I'm concerned about is I don't want people to have the impression that we're hiding things from you, you know, that we're trying to take off points, we're trying to catch you. So let me mention that I try to be as clear as possible about our expectations for homework and where you might lose points, what you should be paying attention to. So one of them is the assignment write-up itself. Uh, I normally would be having TAs pass out a, a printed copy of this. Uh, I think it would be worth your while to print this because you might want to have a highlighter where you highlight various things from the assignment write-up. One of my um, kind of rules of thumb is that if there's something that's here in the write-up, you know, if the write-up says you're supposed to do something and you don't do it, well then that's something where I think it's okay for us to potentially have you lose a point. So pay very close attention to the assignment write-ups so you know what the, what the different requirements are because some of them will be there. And then there will be various style expectations. I'm gonna be talking a lot about style and this is another reason why it's really important to watch the lectures, you know. So I find that some of the students with prior programming experience will skip the lectures and then they don't know these things that I've mentioned to students that are important. So those of you who never programmed before, you can actually have a bit of an advantage if you're watching all the lectures, you're reading the assignment right up carefully, you're kind of uh, trying to do all the right things to make sure that you know the things that could potentially lose you points. So this could be something where, I know it's frustrating to lose points, but you might actually be someone who does better than other students because you're gonna be very responsible about it. So uh, anyway, that's kind of some general advice that this is an area where you can actually uh, have some benefit. I have a, a page here called General Style Deductions. So on this page, I'm going to list things that we would take off a point for potentially uh, on each new homework. So each week when we have a new homework, there may be new style issues that we would be grading for. So I have a list here of the style issues. Uh, that you were missing a class header, you could lose a point. If you did no indentation whatsoever, you could lose a point. Uh, if you used advanced material, you could lose a point. Uh, and I mentioned here that sometimes certain constructs are forbidden. And I'm doing you a bit of a favor here. I won't normally do this. But I pointed out that the assignment write-up tells you that backslash n and system.out.print system are not allowed for homework one. So it's an example of something where the assignment write-up was very clear. Don't use that for the homework. So that could lose you a style point uh, if you, if you um, did that for this particular homework. It's not that those aren't good things, it's just that we don't want you to use them on this homework. Uh, in terms of advanced material, there may be some of you who know more programming, and you may know a better way of doing things, but we don't want you to do it that way. We want you to kind of pretend that you're like the other students, you're just beginning, you don't know those advanced topics. We want a level playing field. We want everyone to solve the problem with the same tools. So we don't want people to be using advanced materials. Uh, and then there's a list of things here. If you've ever studied Java before, you might know about some of these things. And so you would know that we don't want you to use these features of Java. Again, it's not that they're bad features of Java. It's just that we want to have a level playing field where everybody is using the same tools. And if you haven't used Java before and you don't know what these things mean, don't worry about it. That's actually good because it means you're not going to be tempted to use them. Another thing that you're going to find uh, in terms of our grading is that we're very picky that you exactly match output, you know, that it's, it's exactly correct. So this program, for example, involves a song, 
And we want you to, to have exactly this text for the song, uh, even including the word eagled, for example, in the middle of this song. Uh, but we give you the text that we want you to produce, and there's a tool here called the Output Comparison Tool that I'm going to show you uh, uh, in what we're going to do in a minute that lets you check and make sure that you have just the right answer. Anyway, so those were uh, a few uh, tips, a few points about our grading and what's going to happen. Um, what I want to do for the rest of the lecture is I want to work through an example with you um, that is like a mini version of what you're going to do on the homework. And so that's going to let me talk to you about the homework uh, and uh, introduce one new concept uh, and also to kind of talk about these issues of style things that might come up. So I'm going to click on that output comparison tool and there are a lot of things that are available here like you can bring up that output for the song and then what we're going to be able to do is to paste over here you know, our output and ask this tool to compare and make sure we've got it right. I'll show you that in a minute. But what we're going to do then is I'm going to use this figure output here. So our goal is to write a program that's going to produce this as output, you know, this little uh, uh, bit of text here as output. So that's what we'll do in the lecture today. Uh, I've got JGrasp open here. I had one student who, uh, who, in office hours, who was confused about the fact that there's kind of this split thing here where there's an editing window up here and there's a message window down here and there's a little bar here you can grab. You can move this up and down to kind of be able to see more of the editing window or see more of the message window. And he had accidentally moved this all the way to the top so he wasn't seeing his editing window. So you might want to be aware of that. And one of the things I didn't show you on Monday, because I'd kind of done it before lecture, but you know, where we'll begin is by saying file new, and we want to have a Java program. So now the editing window is ready for me to start uh, producing a program. So I'm going to say public class figure is what I want to do. So uh, we're, we're making a figure, you know, uh, that seems like a reasonable name. In the homework assignments, I will be very clear for you about what name to use. Uh, your program for the homework is supposed to be called Song. And uh, we can go ahead and save this so that we have it ready. Uh, and I had an old one there, probably from a prior lecture, which is fine. I'll just go ahead and overwrite it. Um, Remember that, if, uh, that every program that is uh, uh, a program that can be executed has got to have a main method. Public, static, void, name, string, bracket, bracket, args. And as I mentioned, that's for now a bit of an incantation. You know, don't worry about understanding all the individual words. We're going to talk about that later. So we've got a class with its set of curly braces, and we've got a main method with its set of curly braces. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I want to produce this output, so I'm going to go here and I'm going to select all of those lines of output and I'm going to make a copy. So I just gave a command on my Mac to make a copy. And I'm going to come over here and put my cursor right here and I'm going to paste it all in. Now you know that's not going to work. You know, we're not going to be able to just, you know, put output here. We're going to have to turn these things into string constants. We're going to want to do uh, system.out.println commands. Uh, but uh, uh, bear with me. You'll see what we're going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type here tab tab system.out.println with an open quotation mark. So uh, I'm, I'm just kind of trying to turn this into a line of code that's like what we were doing in our lecture last time, a println command, you know, that's going to have some specific text. And we'll put something at the end, but let's do all of those uh, later. Uh, I'm kind of doing the beginning part of it now. In terms of indentation, we want you to use indentation to indicate the level of structure. So at the outermost level, we have a class. Inside of that class, we currently have one thing, called main, and it's the one thing inside the class, so it gets indented by one tab stop, you know, one, one level in. But inside of main, we're going to have various commands, and so to indicate that that's inside of main, we put that one tab stop in as well. So that's why I'm two tab stops in here. So let me make a copy of the system.out.println. Oops, not all of that. I want the, oops, 
I can do this right. We want to grab this and we want to get the two tab stuff. So make a copy of that. So let me come here and paste that in. Come here and paste it in. Come here and paste it in. And so we'll just kind of, we're trying to turn all of these things into Printlin commands. So, oops, I don't want to erase it. I want to be there. Uh, we want to be there and there and there. I'm going to scooch down a bit. And we want to have our cursor here and here and here and here and here. And then there's another one of these blank lines that we need to be able to have. This one almost done. This one and this one and this one. It's looking a little more like a program now. Uh, at the end of this lo first line, this Printlin command, we need to have a close quote, a right paren, and a semicolon. Remember that you have to use quotation marks, you know, to kind of indicate the end of a string, and then uh, it's within the parentheses, uh, and a semicolon at the end of every command. So I can just kind of do that on each of these different lines, and you guys can be placing your bets if you want about whether this is gonna work. Um, you might wanna be trying to notice what's, what you're seeing here. There's some interesting things that are going on here. Um, okay, let's kind of keep going with more. We'll finish out these other lines uh, to try to turn them into Printlin commands. Okay, so uh, I've got something that maybe would produce the output. Um, I mean, this was kind of a tedious way to do it, but actually a nice thing about it is that it kind of guarantees that I know that I have the output exactly right, you know, because I copied it from the original. So, uh, but there's some, some stuff going on. I think, you know, some of you might realize this isn't going to work right, or you can notice some weird things that you're seeing here. So let me hit compile. And, whoa, a whole bunch of messages here. Uh, we had a total of 12 errors. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, the number of errors that you get. It doesn't mean you have to drop the course. Uh, I, you know, what you want to do is to kind of look at the first error, sort that out. Uh, sometimes there's an error that you've made, and you've made the same error in multiple places. You know, that's, that's true here. So you might be able to fix a lot of these with that. Sometimes, you know, there's one error that just throws the whole thing off. And so sometimes you get a lot of error messages, even though there really aren't so many errors. Um, let me also mention, someone had asked me about uh, that their color scheme was different in JGRASP. Uh, I'm using a set of colors that uh, uh, a prior instructor had kind of decided they thought worked best with our projection system in these classrooms. So I have slightly different colors probably than you do, but the, the color coding is kind of telling us something interesting. And what it said here is that I have an unclosed string literal. So this would normally be the time where I'd say, we you know, what's, what's going on, what's the problem? And uh, so, you know, I usually have someone who can see that we talked about this last time, that there's the, the uh, idea of escape sequences. You know? And so uh, when you use a backslash, that's something that's an escape sequence that we can use, for example, with a quotation mark that when you embed a backslash quotation mark, that two character sequence in the middle of a string, it represents a quotation mark. That's what's going on here. So there's a backslash quotation mark that's right here. And so instead of closing the string, I'm embedding a quotation mark inside of the string. So it thinks the right paren is part of the string and it thinks the semicolon is part of the string. Look at the color coding, see how it's all red. So Java thinks that all of that is part of one string, and it says you never closed your string. You never, you never put a closing quote on all this. So we could put a closing quote and then a right paren and a semicolon, but that's not obviously what we want to do. We, we don't want to have this right paren and the semicolon be part of our string. The problem here was that I had a backslash, I wanted to have a backslash character. And so remember that there was an escape sequence for that as well. Backslash, backslash is what I have to use in order to have an actual backslash character. So watch what happens when I change that to two backslashes. So now I'm embedding a backslash character. Notice that, you know, then there's the quote. Notice the right paren is now black. 
So now I'm closing the quote. Now that, that quotation mark is being used to close the quote and the color coding is kind of letting us know that that's okay. So I can do that here as well. And if I take a look down here, uh, usually at this point in the lecture, I'd ask students to tell me what other lines are, are, are changed. But since you're not here, I'll just kind of, you know, we're looking for these lines that have the, the color problem. And so that one also needs it. And this one needs it. You know, it's kind of my use of those backslash characters that are causing a problem. Uh, so I can fix that here and fix that here. So let's see. They all look black now. So maybe the thing is going to compile. So let's take a look. Oh, lots of errors still, but we can take a look and see what it says. Now it's six errors, so it's not quite as many as it had before, but still a problem. So it's worried about this line right here, and it has said illegal escape character. So that's the message that we're getting right here. And so remember, backslash is used for an escape sequence. And so what it sees here is it sees me using a backslash. And what does it see after the backslash? It sees a dot. So it's kind of asking itself, is there a backslash dot escape sequence? And the answer is no. <laughs> there is no backslash dot escape sequence. So it's saying it's an illegal escape character. So, uh, you know, uh, the same kind of problem as I needed to have a backslash there. Uh, if I hit compile, oops, not the, not to run, uh, I meant to say the compile. JGRASP was kind to let me know, are you sure you're ready to run? Because, you know, the, com the compilation hasn't uh, worked right. And now what I have is a backslash followed by an underscore, a different character, but it's the same kind of thing. It's saying, well, that's illegal, uh, an illegal escape sequence as well. So I need to fix those. You know, really, I, I mean, I did this a bit on purpose. I made this a little harder than it needed to be. What I could have done very early on is I could have just found, you know, done a global replace uh, and replaced all of the backslashes with two backslashes, and then uh, I wouldn't have had any of these problems. But, you know, it's a, it's a nice uh, example to be able to see error messages and to be able to deal with what we're getting here. So let's go ahead and hit compile. Now, the compiler didn't say anything. And again, that's good. When the compiler says nothing, we're happy. That means that it didn't encounter any errors. Uh, so let's go ahead and say run and see what it does. And so um, we get some output here. And uh, kind of eyeballing it, it kind of looks like what we had before. But I can do better. I can select these lines of output. I want to come down to here select all of that, and I'm going to give a copy command on my Mac, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to paste it in here. So I'm pasting in what I produced as output to see whether it matches over here, and I can hit compare, and it tells me that there were no differences found. That's what you're looking for. We want you to reach that point where, for the homework, you can use the output comparison tool and make sure that you have the output exactly right. You know, it's going to be worth uh, points if you have some minor error here. Like suppose, for example, that you had an extra blank line in there. So I mean, I just threw in an extra blank line relative to what we had. And if you then ask to compare, it did find a difference. It's kind of curious what it says here. Difference of a, a red greater than. Uh, this is a case where it can be helpful to add line numbers to be able to see what's going on. And it's telling me that line 11 seems to be different. So what it's finding is that Line 11 over here had uh, the underscores on it, and uh, over here I think it had uh, the blank line. So it's kind of giving you an indication of where, where that is, so, and then you can uh, remove the line numbers if you want to. So output comparison, you'll use it for your homework. You'll do this kind of thing to make sure that you have the output correct. So at this point, we have a working program. We have a program that is doing what it was supposed to do. You know, let me, I'll get rid of this little uh, entry here. Uh, it's producing the output that we were asked to produce. Um, you might imagine, sometimes you'll struggle so much with the homework assignments that you'll think that getting the correct output, I mean, that's got to be at least a B, you know, or something like that. But actually, that's not the way we grade. So uh, what we would say here is that this has correct external correctness. You know, so you know, from the outside, uh, when you run it, it seems to behave the right way. And that's usually worth about half the points for the homework. 
So that's that's like a, not even a, a, a D, you know. So uh, that you know that that's only part of what you need to do. But you know that's the external correctness. It is good, kind of know that you've got a program that's that's working, that's getting uh, the right output. But this is an ugly program, you know. There's a it's just there's a lot of stuff going on here that we don't like. Um, let me mention, um, you know, and again, normally in a lecture like this, I'd ask people for suggestions of what bothers them. Uh, I don't have students, so uh, I kind of have to do that for you. Uh, but if you kind of look at this and you think about what kinds of things are going on, there are three things that I want us to be thinking about. Uh, let's first do a relatively minor thing, which is that this println command has this quote, quote in it. Uh, this is supposed to produce a blank line. And I ended up with that quote, quote, because of the way that I created these, uh, these commands. But we consider that bad style, to have kind of a println that has an empty string inside of it. We'd rather have you just have the empty parentheses, you know, a println without the quote, quote there. That's what we used last time in lecture. And this is what we'd rather have you do when you're creating a blank line, is just println with the empty parentheses. So there was another one of these here, and there was another one of these here. So that's how we want you to create blank lines, is println, and not with the, the quote, quote, inside the parentheses. So it's a style issue. This is actually a style issue that we're not going to be taking off for in homework one, but you might as well be practicing it now. It's something that will become a style issue that we would take off for potentially later, but not yet. So that's kind of a, a minor style issue. Now, uh, another thing that students tend to notice when they look at this is that there's a lot of redundancy here. And so that's going to be a major thing we want to talk about. But before we get to the redundancy part, I want to talk about something else. So I want to talk about the, the fact that our main method here has all these printlins, just kind of an endless long stream of printlins. So if you tried to describe what is it this program does, it does a lot of printlins. But if you look at this output, you know, there's, there seems to be like a little sub-figure here, a little sub-figure here, another one here, another one here. So if I was describing it to a person, I think I would say, well, there's four parts of the output. There's kind of four different things that are being produced here. There's this first little sub-figure, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. Uh, and so what I want us to do is to try to recognize that in some way. So that's, gonna, that's what we'll do next, is to try to capture the structure of the program. Um, I usually ask people for suggestions, you know, what do they think they're seeing here? Almost everybody calls that a stop sign, so that works out. People have kind of different ideas of what that looks like. My co-author, Marty Stepp, who made up this example, decided that he thought that was an egg. So I'm going to call that an egg. And I hear people describe this as all sorts of things, a basket or a bowl or whatever. Marty calls it a teacup. So I'm going to call it a teacup. So an egg followed by a teacup, followed by a stop sign. And then what is that? I don't know what that is, but Marty calls it a hat. So we're going to say that it's four things, an egg, a teacup, a stop sign, and a hat. So what I'm going to say over here in my main is that what I would have preferred to have in main is something that's a better indicator of the underlying structure of the task that we're solving. I'd kind of like to say that there's an egg subtask, and then what we have is a teacup subtask, and then we have a stop sign subtask, and then we have a hat. You know, and I'd kind of like to have that be main, where I, you know, main is short and it's a good description of what's going on here. You can see very easily that there are four things being done here, these four different operations. And so main is a very nice summary. And that's the kind of main that we'd like you to write as well, is to kind of write it so that it's a nice uh, summary of what it is that you're going to be doing. So how do we do that? So uh, I told you that you know every program that executes needs to have a main method, but chapter one tells you how you can make your own methods. So what we're gonna be making here are what are known as static methods. You're gonna be defining your own static methods. 
So the way you do that, you're going to look a little bit of an incantation again that we're, it's going to take a little while for us, us to explain to you all the different words we're using, but public static void. Those three words you're going to get used to saying a lot. We're going to be using that a lot in, our, uh, in these early homeworks that we're going to be doing. Public static void, public static void. That's a way of dis defining a static method. Um, and then you give a name for the method. So I want to make an egg method. That's what this first one is, an egg method. And I'm going to have an empty set of parens. Uh, we're going to see things that can go inside those parentheses. You know, main has something inside the parentheses. Those are what we call parameters, and we're going to cover that in chapter three. But that, so that's not for a while. Don't worry about that for now. All of our static methods for now are going to have empty parentheses, and then obviously it has to have a set of curly braces that show what the beginning is, and a set of curly braces that indicate what's the end of the method. So I've captured inside a set of curly braces those printlin commands that produce the egg output. So, uh, I mean, basically the idea would be, look, Java doesn't have an egg command, but just because Java doesn't have an egg command doesn't mean that we can't make our own. So we have the ability to define our own little egg command like this, uh, and then we don't have to worry about all the detailed printlins, we can just refer to it as egg. Whenever I want to produce that output, I just call the egg method uh, and ask Java to produce that output. This problem has an interesting challenge to it in that there are these blank lines. And it's kind of not entirely clear what's the best way to deal with blank lines. Sometimes I think it makes sense to try to have the blank lines be in the methods that you introduce. But I can tell you that what Marty had in mind for this is that he wanted to have the blank lines in main. So I'm gonna, we don't normally put this in main, but uh, I'm gonna, uh, but that's what Marty had intended for this particular example, is that we would have commands for producing the egg output with no blank line in, uh, involved, and the teacup, and then a blank line, and then the stop sign, a blank line, and the hat command. So uh, this was kind of the main that he intended, is that we have a method for each of the four different subfigures, and then printlins that, that produce the um, empty, uh, the, the empty blank line in between. Let me mention something about uh, naming conventions here. I mentioned that the name of a class will always begin with a capital letter, so that's why I called that figure with a capital F. But here we're coming up with names for methods, and methods begin with a lowercase letter. So egg with a lowercase e, main with a lowercase m, teacup with a lowercase t. But when there's more than one word, like stop sign is, I think of as two different words, we do something that's known as camel casing, where uh, the second word, we capitalize uh, the, the name of that word. So if we had, this is a really long name in Java, if I had a method that had a name like that, uh, I would have uh, the first word be lowercase, but all the subsequent words, we capitalize the first letter of the word, and that's supposed to be like camel humps, you know? That's why we call it camel casing. Uh, so that's the convention in Java. I, I didn't do that for teacup, because teacup's one word, but stop sign, I think, is two words, so uh, I did the camel casing uh, capitalization for stop sign. This is not something that we're gonna be taking off points for, style points for, in the first homework, but we are gonna be taking off for it uh, relatively soon, so it's something you might want to get used to. Uh, but so that eventually will be a style issue, although it's not a style issue on the first homework. All right, we've got the egg method. Uh, we want to have a public static void method called teacup uh, that would produce this output here. Where did my cursor go? It's over there. Uh, so that'll be the teacup method. And then we want a public static void stop sign method. And we don't need the command for making the, empty, the blank line. We just need the command for making the stop sign. We don't need that command for making a blank line. And what we would have then is a closed curly brace for that method and public static void hat. You know, something for that method. So um, I want to 
So at this point, um, I often get various questions from students, so you know, I'm gonna uh, anticipate some of the things that you might ask, but I also just wanna talk a little bit about where we're at here. Um, uh, let me, well, let me do this first. Let me compile and make sure that I didn't have an error in what I did there. It compiled without an error, which is good, and when I run it, I can just kind of do an eyeball, and it looks like I have the same output. I could check, you know, if I wanted to be more careful with output comparison. But so this is a correct program that is, that is producing the output, but it has these static methods in it. This is an important in-between state to understand. And so on the calendar for today, I'm gonna to put, put that first version up. I'm gonna call it figure1.java, all the printlands in Maine. And then this is kind of the second version of the program. I'm gonna call this figure2. And so it's the one that has nicer structure. So Maine is much shorter than it would be otherwise because we've introduced static methods. One of the things that um, students ask about usually at this point is what about the ordering of these methods? Does it matter that egg is the second method that I've included in the class? Does it matter that teacup is the third one? And the answer is no. You know, from the point of view of this Java class, so there's a set of curly braces for the class, and what's inside of the class? If we wanted to kind of do an inventory of what's in the class, uh, it's really important I think you know, one, of the, one of the things where novices have trouble communicating with experienced programmers is experienced programmers are very used to looking at structure, seeing structure in things. And so I wanna to try to point that out whenever I can, the way that you should be doing what psychologists call chunking, kind of you know, paying attention to something and collapsing it in your mind and thinking of it as one thing. So I think of all of these lines of code together as being one thing, the main method. So I'm kind of chunking that as, that's a method called main. This is a method called egg. So that's kind of another unit that's inside of this class. This is a method called teacup, which is another unit inside of this class. This is a method called stop sign, another one of these units. And this is a stop sign called hat. So I have one main method and four methods that create these subfigures. I have five methods, a total of five things that are defined inside of this class. The rule in Java is that it doesn't matter at all what order those five things appear in. They can be jumbled in any way you want, any order whatsoever. Uh, what Java does when it, you know, there's something called flow of control, so if this is confusing, read that section of the textbook about flow of control in chapter one. You know, it goes to the main method, always, and then it uses that to decide the order in which to do things. Egg got listed first, so that's the first thing it does. Then it makes a blank line. Then it does teacup. Then it makes a blank line. Then it does stop sign. So it does it in order from beginning to end, whatever you've listed in main, and the methods can be in any order whatsoever. All right, so this is the structure idea. And in your program, you have been asked to do structure for your program. You're told that there are seven verses to the song, and so your main method should have seven method calls, one for each of the different verses, a method for each verse. So that's a structure requirement for the homework that's important to us, uh, that's like what we did here. So you're gonna have to have the seven methods for the seven verses so that your main doesn't become uh, a huge unwieldy uh, main. The next thing I wanna talk about is redundancy. And so, what, so this is an important thing too because um, students don't always understand exactly what we have in mind for redundancy. In the song that you're gonna be working with, there are some, some things in the song that are very repetitive, like there was an old woman who swallowed a this, and there was an old woman who swallowed a that. Uh, the redundancy of, of those uh, lines of the song is not something we want you to deal with. Redundancy for this program is gonna be a very simple kind of idea that we're looking for entire lines of code. So, and here's, here's the way to understand the redundancy issue. I'm, I've asked you to write the program so that it has no redundancy. Look at these three lines right here, which in a minute I'm gonna to refer to as the egg top. And see if you see those same three lines of code anywhere else. And what I would say is you see them here and you see them here. That's redundancy. 
I found three lines of code that occur three times in this program. So we have not eliminated the redundancy. I want to introduce a method to do that. Public static void, I'm going to call it egg top. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those three lines of code and I am going to cut them from here and I'm going to come down to my egg top method and put them here. So I'm going to put those three lines of code there and then I have to come back up here uh, in the egg and I have to include a call on my egg top method in order to get those three lines of code executed. And then I can come here and I find the exact same three lines of code. So I'm going to replace that with a call on egg top. So instead of having the redundancy, I'm instead calling a method that I've defined. So I define that method once, but then I can call it these three different times, egg top. So uh, that extra method here, egg top, uh, allowed me to eliminate the redundancy that I was seeing there. So the question is, is there still any redundancy? So the question is, are there two or more lines of code that are exactly the same here? And the answer is still yes. These two, oops, let me select, these two lines of code right here also appear right here, and they also appear right here. So that's some more redundancy. Let me go ahead and cut those lines of code, and I'm gonna come down here and I'm going to make a public, ooh, I can type public static void a bottom, uh, and I'm gonna put those uh, two lines of code here. And then I have to come back up here, and for my egg, I'm gonna need to say egg bottom. And then I can find the other places where those lines of code appear, and I can replace that with egg bottom. And I can come here where those lines of code appear, and I can replace that with egg bottom. So I'm squeezing out the redundancy so that, you know, I don't have, oops, and I had one more of those. This is, oh no, that was egg top and egg bottom. I'm sorry, I was uh, getting confused. So I've squeezed out the redundancy from my four different subfigure methods. Let me make sure I'll compile, make sure it didn't introduce an error, and we'll do just kind of a quick look at the output to see that it still looks right. I still see our four subfigures. So I think that's pretty good. So that's going to be a challenge for you for this homework, is to eliminate redundancy. Uh, it's a little harder in the song that you're working on. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not the end of the world if you don't get rid of absolutely all of the redundancy. But give it a try. See if you can figure it out. Uh, the way of structuring methods. You can introduce new methods, obviously, to be able to do this. You can have many, many methods uh, in the solution that you're going to have for homework one. Uh, so you're not, you're not having just the seven verse methods. You're going to have a bunch of methods in this first program. So don't worry about that. I wanted to mention one other requirement that's a little unusual in this particular programming assignment is that uh, I ask you not to have the same printlin command more than once. So here's a printlin command that's producing kind of a dashed line. And another occurrence of that Printlin command that's producing a dash line. So normally we wouldn't worry about kind of one line of code, but I have asked you in this homework assignment to worry about that level of, of detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a method I'm going to call line, and I'm going to go ahead and cut this line of code here so that I can have just one occurrence of that Printlin command. I can have a public static uh, void method called line, and I'm going to put that, uh, that system.out.println there that produces the solid line, and that way I'll be able to call it here as well. So I'll be able to uh, replace that. So this println that produces the solid line, the, this particular println text occurs just this one time. So that is a requirement for your homework, is that you have to make sure that you don't have uh, any duplicated print lens like that, they'd have to go into a method. I'm just verifying that, that I didn't do anything that screwed up our output. So this is gonna be kind of our final version of it. I'll add a comment at the top of the class that describes the class, uh, and I'm gonna make this figure three on the calendar for today. 
Now in Maine here, I had these printlands that produced a blank line, and you might think that has to go into a method as well, but that's not true. The only printlands that I'm asking you to worry about are printlands like this that have actual text. So if you have the same printlin in more than one place in your program, that would need to go into a method. But for blank lines, you don't need to worry about trying to put that into a method. That, 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 that does not, uh, that's not part of, of what I'm asking you to do uh, in the homework. So uh, just a reminder that, uh, let me go back to the class webpage, that uh, later today these Zoom links are going to include links to your section Zoom meeting that'll take place tomorrow. Uh, and I'll see you again. Uh, oh, and uh, be on the lookout for uh, the question of the day. I'll update this to have the question that uh, we'll be doing uh, to be able to report in Friday's lecture. Uh, and otherwise, that's all that I have for you today. Thanks. <laughs>